the U.S. needs enough bullets to give the Ukrainians and enough bullets to give the Israelis. It's not a one-for-one -one trade off. Uh, the Israeli war is primarily an air war backed up by some artillery, but you do have that, that trade off with the Ukrainians on the artillery piece because, of course, the Ukrainians have major shortages of ammunition across the front, uh, particularly in the south where they've been trying to drive further towards Melitopol, a, a place where they could range Crimea and, and really put a hurt on the Russians. Uh, but it's just an industrial numbers game. Of course, we saw the stats out of the European Union that, that Bloomberg was reporting this week. They're significantly behind their 1 million uh, ammunition target they're, they're hoping to achieve next year for 155 artillery ammunition. So this just really compounds the industrial problem at a time when the U.S. needs at least. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brevi. We're discussing global flashpoints in U.S. policy with Jack Desh. He's a foreign policy's national security and Pentagon reporter. Jack, welcome back to India and welcome for the first time to our studio. Thanks for giving us time. Thanks for having me. Just wanted to ask you about U.S. deterrence policy when you're talking about the Israel-Hamas uh, war. What is the danger of that deterrence policy not working and the conflict actually widening or deepening, whether you're talking about non-state or state actors? That's been the main fear of American officials, Amitabh. You yeah. just see the, the record out of the Defense Department. Uh, you see the rhetoric and, and you see the posture, right? This has been backed up by numerous American ships, aircraft carriers, all deploying to the Eastern Mediterranean. You have two of the 11 American aircraft carriers now in the Eastern Mediterranean. They're accompanied by a suite of different fighter jets, F F-15, F-16, F-35, A-10s, you name it, they have it. Uh, so this is a significant presence of assets. The question of deterrence, though, is complicated by the fact that this isn't an American war. Uh, the, the administration has been very clear. They're not putting American boots on the ground in support of Israel, unless, of course, there's some sort of self-defense provision that would be triggered. But this leaves the U.S. in a bit of a, a pickle uh, because you have beneath the, the level of armed conflict, beneath the level of the U.S. getting involved on the side of Israel or fighting with Iran, these sort of tit for tat battles, almost like we saw in, in 2022 before the pandemic of uh Iranians basically kind of trying to mow the grass at American installations in the region. Uh, you, you've seen it in Iraq. We've seen it in, in Syria. Over 20 incidents just since October 17th. So this is a situation that seems to be simmering up, uh, but also the Iranians may not want to kick it into full boil as well. So you have uh, this similar deterrence picture almost, but again, at, at a higher level, higher simmer than you would typically see. You've written about it, and if you'd like to elaborate on uh, what you see is how President Vladimir Putin can take advantage of the Israel Hamas war. It's it's an indirect way of yeah. taking advantage, right? The American officials have been very fond of calling Putin a uh, firefighter and an arsonist in, in the way he carries out his policy in the Middle East. Uh, and we've seen that, of course, in, in Syria with the way he intervened in 2015 stoking the, the violence there with uh, the, the bombings in Aleppo and in other places like that, stoking the immigration crisis that we saw into Europe. Um, so this isn't a, a place where we're going to see, again, Russian boots on the ground, Russian warplanes. We will see uh, tremendous amounts of Russian disinformation, bot farms kicking into overdrive across the former Soviet Union. So this is really just uh, another page out of Putin's disinformation uh, sort of mind games playbook but nothing specifically in terms of hard power presence that we're likely to see. Of course, a Hamas delegation going to Moscow earlier in the week. So there's a, a diplomatic angle to play, perhaps a military aid angle to play. Uh, but the Russians are, are skeptical, too, of getting directly involved, lest this situation boil over and hurt their economic interests. Jack, so the U.S. can at the moment, or do you visualize it, anything changing in its handling of two different wars? I mean, the Israel-Hamas war and the Russia-Ukraine war. The challenge is, is an industrial challenge almost, right? The, the U.S. needs enough bullets to give the Ukrainians and enough bullets to give the Israelis. It's not a one-for-one -one trade off. Uh, the Israeli war is primarily an air war backed up by some artillery. But you do have that, that trade off with the Ukrainians on the artillery piece because, of course, the Ukrainians have major shortages of ammunition across the front. 
uh, particularly in the South, where they've been trying to drive further towards Melitopol, a, a place where they could range Crimea and, and really put a hurt on the Russians. Uh, but it's just an industrial numbers game. Of course, we saw the stats out of the European Union that, that Bloomberg was reporting this week. They're significantly behind their one million uh, ammunition target they're, they're hoping to achieve next year for 155 artillery ammunition. So this just really compounds the industrial problem at a time when the U.S. needs at least. The U.S. is like India, just entering into election year mode. Uh, how, how do you see these two conflicts playing out uh, domestically? And usually they, they don't strike much uh, resonance with the, the voter. And do you see any danger of, uh, well, not Ukraine falling off the map, but uh, being lowered in uh, the positioning because of what uh, America has to do for Israel? We've already seen it happen. I mean, I was in Brussels just a, a couple of weeks ago talking to officials at, at NATO, different country delegations, and you saw the moment where the TVs flipped from covering Ukraine to covering Israel. I mean, this was a, a 180 shift, basically, that was going on in that headquarters. And everyone's really trying to wrap their head around, too. You've built these suites of sophisticated technology. You've built these surveillance systems. The Israelis had walls that were going 10 feet into the ground. Um, that Hamas was able to send paragliders over and drive trucks through. And so it's just raising a lot of questions in the West about, is this high-tech approach to warfare actually going to work uh, when dollars come to donuts? Or are you going to be in a, a shooting war in the future or planning for a shooting war in the future where the old technology is really going to matter far more? So it, it's kind of this this mind shift that's that's going into play within the West uh, about this war that's, that's really uh, changed, changed minds. In terms of the election season, we've already seen the President Biden uh, kind of try and, and push this argument that the industrial problem could actually be a benefit for the jobs market in America, right? And the classic line about U.S. elections is it's the economy, stupid. People are going to vote on whether they have more money in their pocket this year than they did four years ago. Uh, and so Biden is sort of banking on the fact he can begin to kind of lay down the factories, restart the old ammunition supply dumps that, that used to exist way back in the Cold War uh, and have that be some economic benefit, but we still haven't seen signatures on those contracts yet. And we've seen Biden positioning himself because I think there were key states where he was meeting people when reports suggested that the Muslim vote was against him because of what is happening. But yeah, that's domestic politics. But do you agree with some analysts who say China is taking advantage of the situation and opening up a or deepening and widening a third front in the Indo-Pacific? We've seen kind of a tepid response from China, at least in their statements about um, Hamas and Israel, um, of course, not really favoring Israel, not condemning uh, the Hamas attacks. So kind of trying to take this, this strange middle ground. Um, of course, uh, in the Philippines, we see a constant fight that's been bubbling up over the past few months over um, the second Thomas Shoal, uh, where the Philippines sank um, uh, an old U.S. ship, the Sierra Madre, basically to, to lay claim to that island about 20 years ago. Um, the Chinese have basically been very, very aggressively harassing those Philippine boats, soaking them with water cannons a, a couple of months ago. Um, the U.S. Put, putting out harsher statements and, and basically trying to communicate to the Chinese. The Philippines is, is one of the treaty allies of the United States in the Indo-Pacific and if you actually do mess with them or get involved in the shooting war, that's something the, the United States is going to get involved in. So we've seen uh, a more of a steely deterrence posture a little bit, um, but nothing in terms of actually, you know, hard boots on the ground, more American ships, more Coast Guard assets going to the Philippines. And that's that's a real problem. That's a place where China has incredible advantage, the biggest shipbuilding industry in the world, the biggest Navy in the world, uh, the biggest Coast Guard. Uh, and now they're deploying that all to the Second Thomas Shoal. Um, to basically harass and, and make life difficult for the Philippines as they're turning much closer to the United States. You are mentioning water cannons that, that was escalated by the Chinese Coast Guard, the collision as well. Do you see uh, U.S. deterrence moving towards... You already have joint exercises with the Philippines, yeah. But in this particular uh, area and the Thomas uh, Shoal, as you were pointing out, could the U.S., uh, to deter China, have joint patrolling with the, the Philippines? I mean, if they see the Chinese trying to escalate it and, and trying to bring down, the U.S. trying to bring down temperatures or warn the Chinese off. Yeah, theoretically, there could be options where, where the U.S. could have escorts 
uh, yeah. the U.S. could be involved in sort of more of a maritime policing mission. We haven't seen that to this point. Of course, this isn't the first time that flashpoints between uh, the Philippines and China have bubbled up in the South China Sea. Of course, we saw Whitson Reef yep. several years ago, although, of course, the Philippines had a much more pro-Chinese bent at that time, and that sort of messed up with politics in Manila. But certainly that is on the table um, if this situation continues to bubble up further. The other thing that's going on in the background, too, is as you've seen the Marcos administration come in and take a very pro-American tack, go away from what we saw under Duterte, where he was basically threatening for four years to kick out American troops. We see these these new bases coming online, not full bases, but military installation sites, basically. Those will probably continue to grow and expand. They've grown much faster than analysts in Washington have expected. So one side effect of this could be to drive the United States and the Philippines closer, integrate that military technology better. And then the question that policymakers in Washington are going to be asking of the Philippines is, can we use these paces if the war in Taiwan kicks off? Sure. Uh, apart from uh, Secretary of Defense Austin constantly speaking with his counterparts in Israel and anyone else involved in the region, he's also been calling up uh, or speaking to the Philippines counterpart Secretary Gilberto as well. What is the red line that would trigger the U.S. mutual defense treaty with Philippines that China crosses? It's somewhat ambiguous, but you, ha you would have to imagine a shooting war would be mm -hmm. uh, the thing that would trigger a potential red line. Now, of course, I think there's reticence in China to, to go too far. There's reticence in the United States to get into a shooting war over something like the Philippines. Uh, Taiwan may be another story, but uh, again, that's an issue that's, that's further down the road and certainly much closer uh, of a territorial fight for, for the Chinese who see it as part of their country. Um, so that's, that's a bigger challenge down the road, but potentially the flashpoint could be, um, you know, real argy-bargy, I guess, in, yeah. in that region. Understood. Uh, when it comes to the Quad, Jack, uh, your views, I mean, it's already been institutionalized at the topmost level, with the top leaders having summits. But do you think there needs to be another layer there, like uh, what we have, the US and India and many other bilateral countries, a two plus two in the Quad, so like a four plus four, as in the foreign and defense ministers of all four countries also having a meeting. Do you think that's something that's needed? I think this is one of the fascinating things that's, that, that's going on right now in, in India, right? And you, and you can speak to this better than I can, but just sort of this, this conflagration of minilateral organizations that's developed basically as, as the United Nations General Assembly, as the United Nations Security Council, have really lost relevance uh, amid the Russia-Ukraine war. So you see uh, the potential for, for new groupings. Uh, India is already obviously in the I, I2, U2 uh, which that's a very ambiguous grouping. Nobody in Washington is really sure what it's doing. Um, you have India involved in the Quad. Uh, so I think there is a desire in the U.S. to push further on the relationship to get India much closer. That's been a drive of, of course, Kurt Campbell at, at the White House, um, other folks who are looking at the issue. Um, so maybe it could be sort of a, a two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus two, plus two, plus two <laughs> grouping. I, we could we could see, uh, but you know logistically, they sort of have to figure out exactly how the capabilities are going to work. And the big question, too, um, you have several countries sort of in and around the Quad involved in the Five Eyes. India, of course, not in the Five Eyes, not using intelligence systems that are communicating directly with uh, their Western counterparts. So really, the, the hole in the swing uh, for the United States and the Western allies is getting more countries like India, like the countries in Southeast Asia, to get systems that talk to Western counterparts. Well, talking about systems and talking about 2 plus 2, uh, the India-US 2 plus 2 is, is scheduled for early November, the next uh, round. And how do you assess, since we last talked, um, India-US relations, especially in the defense sphere, uh, there is talk of the MQ-9B uh, Reapers, or 31 of them a deal, and uh, the GE414 engine as well. So how do you assess the military strand of the relationship? Well, it's it's clear, I mean, ever since um, the, the fighting in Gahawan several years ago, that you've seen just this relationship uh, take a U-turn and, and really accelerate uh, as India's become less non-aligned, certainly, uh, and much more in the Western camp. So I think there are going to be some of those big ticket defense items like you talked about, uh, coming online, getting India more drones, getting their systems and their forces more modernized is going to be a Amer uh, major priority for the Americans. There's also a question, too, of just in sort of more of a regional context, how the U.S. is going to use India. Of course, there's there's been talk of 
expanding basing agreements in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Those are, of course, now, I guess, very limited refueling capabilities. The U.S. doesn't even use them very frequently. But I, I think when you talk about actually integrating the quad, that's the next thing, right, is you're going to have more bomber rotations of the U.S. through Australia. Uh, you're going to have more use of Japan. So it's getting India, I guess, up to that level, up to that level of infrastructure, up to that level of capability uh, is going to be key for the Americans. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to be one of the, the major things that the Defense Department is going to be pressing on. I know it's a very widespread report, but just wanted your assessment of the key takeaways on the uh, DOD's report on uh, China's military and security uh, posture. Well, the major thing, of course, is the expansion of, of China's nuclear yeah. program set set to double very shortly. Um, so the size of China's arsenal has just ticked up and ticked up and ticked up. And we see in, in Western China, of course, those missile silo fields expanding quite significantly. That's a major concern for policymakers in Washington because the use of, of China's nuclear posture is ambiguous. It's not clear how they would go up the escalation ladder in a situation like Taiwan, uh, a hot war potentially over the South China Sea. So trying to get more clarity on what China's intentions actually are when the Americans and the Chinese really aren't talking. Um, last in, in 2021, when we were talking, there were dialogues. There were direct dialogues between the defense secretary uh, and, of course, his, his Chinese counterpart, although they give him somebody at the lower level of the PLA. Uh, now we haven't seen those since November of 2022 at, at that level. So the U.S. keeps asking China to talk. There's no response on the other Chinese end of the line. And you have this this sort of ominous threat in the background of, of nuclear escalation. It's interesting that you're, you're pointing or focusing on the nuclear element because there's another bipartisan congressional uh, report also that warns of uh, an aging U.S. nuclear deterrence against Russia and China. That's right. Yeah, the um, the bipartisan strategic report that was released uh, a couple of weeks ago now, a warning about um, the increase in those capabilities from China, also the uh, the plutonium pits that America uses to produce its its nuclear weapons, the inputs that that go into those nuclear weapons, aging, and there's there's not a lot of planning to expand pit production to move it forward. Uh, people who are much more hawkish on nuclear weapons would like to see that move much faster. Uh, the administration, of course, is pushing for a new Minuteman variant of the ICBM, upgrading that leg. But Biden is countered uh, within his own party from some folks who say uh, you don't need a nuclear triad. You might dismantle uh, the ICBM leg of the triad versus more classical deterrence theorists who say you still need submarines, still need uh, nuclear missiles, you still need uh, those bombers as well. Uh, those bombers coming online too, of course, the B-21 Raiders, that will be an important upgrade for the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Uh, but also you have the industrial base problem again biting here because the U.S. has to produce submarines for Australia. Uh, they have to produce Virginia-class submarines and then perhaps Columbia-class submarines in the future if AUKUS is really going to work. So um, again, just a major industrial base problem the United States is probably going to have to build another shipyard, more aircraft facilities. It's just you have to go back to a scale we haven't been at in decades. We talked about uh, the possibility of a third front in the Indo-Pacific and China taking advantage of what's happening in the U.S. being, quote-unquote, distracted with the Israel-Hamas war and the Russia-Ukraine war. Do you see uh, the Taiwan uh, issue becoming uh, more prominent? Does, would Xi Jinping be tempted to you know, make a move there if the U.S.'s assets are involved in two different theaters, so to speak? Well, perhaps. I mean, we're sort of in the middle of what's called the Davidson window in Washington uh, that was articulated by the former top U.S. military commander in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Admiral Philip Davidson, who basically said by 2027, as China finishes its military modernization plan, uh, it's going to be more ready or perhaps ready um, for an invasion of Taiwan. Now, this is one of the toughest military problems you can conceive of, right? Even if Taiwan went to war in the state that its military is in, and I think there's definitely a lot of questions about its preparedness, you would still have a very bloody invasion, and it's not necessarily clear what way it would go. Obviously, China has enormous mass in numbers. They'd be able to send enormous masses of landing ships, but you might end up in block-to-block -block fighting uh, in, in Taipei and in other landing sites across the island, which, of course, as you get further inland, becomes more hilly, becomes more rocky. Uh, the terrain becomes much more difficult. So we've seen China continue its pace of exercises over Taiwan. 
uh, very considerable air incursions, basically sort of resetting the precedent last year when Nancy Pelosi uh, showed up in Taiwan and the Chinese planes escorted her in, mm -hmm. uh, an unwelcome escort for her. But we've seen since then, uh, basically China resetting uh, the boundary, basically now flying not just into the air defense identification zone that forces Taiwanese aircraft up to intercept them, but also over the median line, which is a new story, a new development uh, in China's incursions and aggressive behavior. So I think we'll definitely see that continue to tick up. Um, it's hard to know what's inside Xi Jinping's head, though, about what he's actually going to do and when he's going to do it. Jack Desh, again, absolutely appreciate your time and sharing your experience and your expertise with us. Thank you, Amitav. For our viewers, do send in feedback uh, for this interview. Follow all our social media handles, including our uh, Telegram channel, to get the latest articles that we put up on our website or interviews like this with Jack Desh on our YouTube channel. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitav Revi.